Well, thank you all very much for coming. What I'd like to try and get across to you in the next 10 minutes is um, a very wonderful example of natural selection operating on human populations, one of the best examples that we have. And it happens to involve two very important, um, very uh, significant public health problems, those of inherited blood disorders and of malaria. So the inherited diseases of hemoglobin, which is, as many of you know, the red substance in our blood cells that takes oxygen from the lungs and delivers it to other parts of the body, other cells in the body, diseases of hemoglobin, disorders of hemoglobin that can be passed on from um, a parent to child, are a major global health burden, and according to um, Professor Weatherall, they, are, they can be seen as an emerging global health burden. We in Oxford have a long tradition of um, studying hemoglobin disorders and indeed other disorders of the blood, uh, mainly due to the efforts of Professor Weatherall, who was the head of the Department of Medicine for a very long time and the Regis Professor of Medicine here, and continues after his retirement to still be very active in the field. So disorders of haemoglobin are a very major problem worldwide. Now, malaria, I'm sure many of you know, is also a considerable um, problem which continues to um, exist despite efforts that have been made to control it by controlling its malaria vector and through drugs and bed nets. Um, we still don't have a vaccine for malaria so despite our best efforts, we still have a very large number of children, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, dying from this disease. And the current, the latest figures here are under a million, but for most of, of my career, I have always used the figures of between one and two million. And that's where, uh, that's, that was what we were led to believe was the extent of the number of deaths per year occurring from malaria, much of which is concentrated, as you can see from this graph, in sub-Saharan Africa. And many of these are, under children, uh, are in children who are under five years of age. So what's the link, then, between these two very important um, human diseases? Well, about 60 years ago, a very remarkable man called J.B.S. Haldane, who also was from Oxford, um, grew up here and worked here, very um, close to this uh, museum, but not quite in it. Um, he observed, he made the very important observation that populations that had high frequencies of inherited blood disorders often lived in regions with very high incidence of malaria. He was looking at the time specifically at the incidence of a particular hemoglobin disorder called thalassemia, which occurred in the Mediterranean, which has had a very long history of um, exposure to malaria, although, of course, it's no longer prevalent there. Now, just the fact that they co-occur, their geographical co-occurrence is, of course, not reason enough to um, assign or what the, the, the make a connection between them, but the real reason to think that blood disorders might have an influence on the outcome of malaria infection has to do with the complex life cycle of the parasite, Plasmodium falciparum, which causes one of the, which is one of the species that cause malaria, um, but in particular is a species that causes the kind of malaria that kills all those children, um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And while this is quite a busy slide and it involves, all I want you to take away from it really is that it involves within the human host, so, so the life cycle involves the mosquito vector in which a lot of um, stuff happens within the midgut, but also a very large portion of the life cycle is within the human host and 
that life cycle itself is pretty complex, but as you can see, it involves the red blood cells. So for part of its life, the malaria parasite lives in the red blood cell. So here's a pretty picture of the parasite and a not so pretty picture of what it does to a red blood cell. Here's a nice healthy red blood cell and here's a blood cell that has been parasitized by um, malaria. And this is where it lives for a very large part of its um, life cycle. And so it makes every bit of sense that any alterations to that environment may have an impact on the um, consequence, uh, on the infection, the outcome of infection. So this was an idea that came into being about 60 years ago due to Holden and has been investigated very thoroughly since. And we know now that several blood disorders protect against malaria. And what I'm going to focus on in the next few minutes are disorders of hemoglobin, which, um, as I said, are some of the commonest disorders, inherited disorders. And of these, perhaps many of you will have heard of sickle cell, um, the sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait, which here, which is a particular disorder of hemoglobin, which causes the red cells that contain that kind of hemoglobin to stiffen up, um, especially when they're under conditions of low oxygen. And these stiffened cells can cause all sorts of problems by blocking up the blood vessels and creating a cascade of other pathologies. Now, what we know now through um, the work of, of, of many researchers is that the gene which causes sickle cell anemia can offer over 90% protection against death from malaria to the people who carry only one copy of it. And this explains why this extremely deleterious mutation has been maintained in many populations to, at high frequencies. So for example, many parts of Africa, you'll find frequencies between 10 and 20%, which is very unusual for something that has, is, is so bad for us. So what is sickle cell? anemia, and what it, why is it that people who carry only one copy of it are protected against malaria? Well, to understand that, we have to consider the actual structure of hemoglobin, which is this wondrous molecule that um, carries oxygen to our cells. Um, hemoglobin consists of four different subunits. It's made up of four different subunits. Um, two alpha globin units and two beta globin units. And I'd like to, you to visualize these now as sort of little, four little blobs, two of alpha and two of beta. The genes that encode for the, the alpha and beta globin subunits actually lie on different chromosomes. And we have four genes because we are diploid, we have two chromosomes, um, two of each chromosome. On each chromosome 16, we have two alpha globin genes, which gives us a total of four. And on chromosome 11, we have two beta globin genes, one from each parent, which um, produces our beta globin units, which then assemble and form hemoglobin. Now, what happens in sickle cell is that due to a mutation in the globin gene, the actual um, hemoglobin, that's the, the beta globin unit that's produced has, is structurally altered. So you, the beta globin unit that's produced is a little bit wonky. And so the hemoglobin that gets made out of two of the normal alpha globin units and two of these wonky beta globin units has slightly different properties to normal hemoglobin and this is what causes these, the, the characteristics uh, shape of cells that carry this uh, particular type of hemoglobin. And as I've described to you already, that that particular kind of stiffening of the cells ca can cause a very serious pathology um, to people who have this problem. Now, if you have 
both of your both copies of your um, beta globin gene um, altered so as to produce only sickle variants, sickle uh, structural uh, structural variants of the beta globin, then you're in very deep trouble. And these people who have sickle cell disease um, tr typically used to die in infancy now can be kept alive through medical intervention. Um, but people who have only one copy, although they do have some of these sickle cells, are in fact protected against death from malaria by virtue of having an altered environment in which the parasite has to grow. So that's how sickle cell works. But the two other important um, genetic disorders of hemoglobin are the thalassemias, which involve a slightly different mechanism to that of, of sickle. What happens in alpha thalassemia is that one, of these, one or more of these um, genes on chromosome 16 that are producing the alpha globin molecules, um, units, sub subunits, gets knocked out, which what that does is it reduces the amount of alpha globin available to make normal hemoglobin, which then means that instead of having, first of all, what this does is reduces the number of the amount of normal hemoglobin around, but what it also does is it produces, leads to an excess of the beta globin chains. And these beta globin chains can cause um, serious problems for the cell, especially because, and this is beyond my PowerPoint expertise, some of them occasionally f uh, clump together and form tetramers themselves, which can precipitate and really um, mess up the cell. So that's how alpha globin, um, I mean alpha thalassemia, um, occurs, causing anemia um, and other problems for um, the carriers. But again, it has been shown through a number of studies that this particular condition, um, which can be quite severe if you've lost more than one of those genes, also protects about, um, provides up to about 50% protection for malaria, against death from malaria. Now, beta thalassemia, which is similar, again, in that what happens is one of the beta globin genes is altered so that you get not wonky beta units being made, but a reduction in the level, the amount of beta globin units, subunits being made. And this again leads to an excess of these alpha chains, which similarly causes problems for the individual. Again, beta globin frequencies have risen um, to very high levels in some parts of the world, like the Mediterranean, and I believed this is also believed to happen through the agency of protection against malaria. Now, so these are some of the most common inherited single gene disorders in the world, alpha and beta thalassemia. What happens if they're inherited together? So if you have alpha thalassemia, you get your alpha chains reduced, so you've got fewer alpha chains around, and you would normally have an excess of the beta chains. But if you also have concurrently have beta thalassemia, some of your beta, cell, uh, beta globin production is compromised, and therefore some of those excess beta globin units are actually not going to be there. So you have a better balance between these different subunits, which means, in fact, and this has been shown from, by David Weatherall and others, that two inherited hemoglobin disorders can actually be less severe than one. So genetic disorders of hemoglobin, which protect against um, death from malaria, also have this property. We're starting to realize that they interact in surprising ways. I've just shown you how a positive interaction can occur, and that two blood disorders can be less severe than one, but we are now also um, finding out that they can interact negatively, so that two malaria protective mutations can actually cancel each other out. And this is work from Tom Williams and his colleagues in Kilifi in Kenya. And what they did was they looked at 
the level of protection in children who had only the sickle cell trait, only alpha thalassemia, or both, and you'd expect that the children who had both would be you know, super protected against malaria. And as it turned out from their studies, very counterintuitively, these children had no protection at all from malaria. They're, they were as susceptible as people with normal hemoglobin. So what we're starting to do now, still carrying forward that wonderful idea of Holden's in 1949, is to try and understand the complexities of these interactions. And so I'll just leave you with this one message, that the high prevalence of hemoglobin disorders due to selection by malaria provides one of the best examples of human evolution that we have to date. But we're still striving to understand the mechanisms behind this phenomena, a phenom a phenomenon and how we can, and we're still struggling to reduce the burden of these extremely important human diseases. Thank you very much.